This is the 1.5 million pound Hennessy Venom F5, one of the most powerful cars on the planet. Its name comes from the Fujita scale, a system of measuring the intensity of tornadoes, the most dangerous of which are categorized as F5. At this level, tornadoes produce wind speeds of up to 318 miles an hour, which fittingly is the top speed that this car has been designed to reach. It uses a 6.6-litre V8 LS engine that's been uprated with drag spec internals and giant turbos to produce 1,817 horsepower and 1,617 newton meters of torque. Its nickname is Fury and its purpose is to obliterate records. But today, top speed isn't what I am interested in. It's all very well pounding up a runway at triple digit speeds beginning with a two or a three. But let's face it, when are you actually going to get to do that in the real world? Most runways just aren't long enough. And even on the autobahn, doing 300 miles an hour, well, it's just irresponsible, isn't it? So the question that I want to know is, what's this car actually like to drive in the real world? And it's 1,800 horsepower, too much horsepower. Right, let's find out. Second gear, floor it. Oh my. <laughs> I'm doing that again. Oh my Lord. Say it'll do 0 to 62 in 2.6 seconds and of course the tesla fanboys will say so what but listen to these numbers it'll do 0 to 200 kilometers an hour in 4.7 seconds 4.7 it'll also do 0 to 300 kilometers an hour in 10 seconds flat and 0 to 400 in 20 seconds this thing's quicker than a bugatti chiron it's quicker than anything how is this car even road legal? Never mind that. How does it even exist? It's the love child of John Hennessy, who focuses on modifying existing vehicles in the pursuit of speed. But to realize his lofty ambitions to make the fastest possible cars, John has had to turn his hand to creating something bespoke. The F5 begins with a carbon chassis, which weighs a mere 86 kilograms and has a torsional rigidity of 52,000 newton meters per degree, 2,000 more than a Bugatti Chiron. It finishes with the engine, the same LS small block used in the Chevy Corvette Z06, but here it's been upgraded and strengthened in a number of ways. The displacement has been lowered to 6.6 .6 liters. It breathes with the help of two ceramic coated turbos and features titanium inlet valves, forged steel conrods and Inconel exhaust valves. But to realize the engine's extreme top speed potential, plenty of work has also gone into the F5's exterior design. Weight is obviously a very important factor with this car. The F5 tips the scales at 1,360 kilograms. Impressive, but look at the shape of the car. You won't see much in the way of aerodynamic accoutrements, no massive rear wing, not many flicks and scoops. And that's because this car doesn't need enormous amounts of downforce. It needs to be massively slippery through the air in order for it to achieve those incredible top speeds. But there's plenty of very interesting detail in this car. This badge at the front, for example, it might look like a sticker because it's perfectly smooth, but it's actually a very thin piece of aluminium eight microns thick. That's thinner than the thickness of a human hair. They apply that directly to the bodywork and then lacquer over it in order to keep that as smooth as possible so the airflow isn't disrupted as it hits the badge. These headlights are very distinctive. Mr. John Hennessy wanted headlights that stood out from a distance and he certainly got them. They're in the shape of an F, which relates to the car's name, F5. And if you look closely here, there's an aero blade just at the front edge, which is detached from the rest of the clamshell. And its purpose is to smooth and sculpt the air as it moves along the side of the car. Lightweight forged wheels offset. 265-19s at the front and 345-20s at the back. And all of them have this lovely H detail in the center caps. The rubber is Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s and the brakes are carbon ceramics. 390 millimeters at the front and at the rear with six piston calipers up front and fours at the back. 
you might have noticed that the fenders stick out a mile, creating a bit of a gap at the front compared to the narrow bodywork. Not ideal for aerodynamics, but they did want a wide track for stability and narrow bodywork for aero. They've got around the problem though by installing these air vents just behind the wheel arch. What that does is to create a pressure difference of high pressure and low pressure air, which effectively seals the air along the side of the car, directing it into the air intakes. There are additional intakes on the deck lid that feed air directly into the turbos. Just behind these is a C-shaped low profile rear wing, but the majority of the F5's downforce comes from the underfloor area, which culminates in a quite magnificent rear diffuser. The rear bumper is a solid piece of carbon fiber, some painted body color and some black, broken up by hundreds of perforations that help with heat extraction. The hollow lights assist here too, serving as reverse knacker ducts to help reduce the extreme temperatures from the engine bay. Under the carbon fiber engine cover, the F5 uses yet more heat resistant material, including gold leaf on the rear bulkhead and Cerakote, a material used in gun barrels to stop them overheating under the wing and between the mid mounted exhausts. On the inside of the Venom F5, and I know I say this a lot, but it's racy. And that's because it is genuinely racy. I can't remember sitting in another vehicle that feels more like a racing car than this one. Obviously it starts with this incredible looking yoke. I'll get back to that in just a second, but the whole thing just feels very minimalist and Spartan almost. They haven't put any superfluous materials where it doesn't belong in order to reduce the weight. And a good example of that is with the leather. They've only applied leather in the places where it makes sense, particularly on the touch points, like on the door cards and on these amazing carbon seats, which by the way, weigh three kilograms each, which is just absolutely absurd. It has air conditioning. There's a pair of vents, which look almost 3D printed, which you can direct to either passenger. And if you look down here, there's a rotary dial, which you can swipe left and right to select between fan speed and temperature. And then you turn the dial to actually increase or decrease the amount you need. There's also your gear selector down here, your window controls, a nose lift, which is actually also a tail lift because it lifts the car at the front and at the rear to help you access steep areas. And on the practicality front, it doesn't have a boot, but it does have a couple of pretty interesting options down here. There's a little area for you to slide your phone into, plus a glove box in the passenger footwell, which I'm told is an ideal place to carry your wallet, your purse, and it's also the ideal size for a nine millimeter pistol. So I'm told anyway. Right, this yoke, absolutely mental. It's brilliant to look at, and it's got some cool functionality built directly into the steering wheel. Sorry, yoke as well. So on the left-hand side, you've got your wiper controls. On the right, you've got your headlight controls. You've got your volume controls, phone, and also this central switch for switching between your drive modes. You've got wet, track, drag, and sport, plus the all singing, all dancing F5 mode, which gives you the maximum horsepower. And a lovely detail, this absolutely beautiful ignition button down at the bottom. Brilliant piece of kit. So what's it actually like to drive on the road? Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. The first thing you notice is how hot it is. It's got air conditioning, but I'm still sweating in here. There is, however, a decent amount of space in the cabin. Two big burly lads can sit side by side with each other. It is incredibly loud in here though. I'm not pushing it right now, but that V8 is just stupendously loud, even at cruising speeds. So you gotta speak up even if you wanna have a conversation with your passenger. And then when you put your foot down, well, don't expect a chat, let's put it that way. The visibility is actually surprisingly impressive. I've got good vision down the front of the bonnet. And also these door mirrors give me plenty of visibility down the sides of the cars as well. It's pretty difficult to see what's going on behind you because of that massive engine cover, but the car does have a camera system and an LCD screen instead of a rear view mirror. So on the whole, it's pretty easy to place where you want it. As for the yoke, I thought I would hate it, but I don't, I don't hate it completely. Obviously when you're low speed maneuvering, it is a bit of a joke because it ends up feeling like you don't quite know how to drive the car. You're grabbing for bits of steering wheel that aren't there. Plus, the F5 doesn't have power steering, so you get a massive arm workout every time you maneuver. One of the best bits has to be the gear selectors. They look amazing and feel 
absolutely tremendous and it makes changing gears such an experience. You want to be in manual mode all the time in this car. As for the gearbox, well it's a seven speed automated manual, a bit like you get in the Lamborghini Aventadors, which means the gear changes aren't perfectly smooth. There's a little bit of a lurch, but when you're doing high speeds and you shift, they just snap. It's actually a joy to use. I think the biggest thing you take away from this car is just the sound. It sounds like a race car, and of course the speed. It's difficult to know what to really expect from an 1800 horsepower car, but this, this isn't what I was expecting. I was expecting to go anywhere near the throttle and have the thing chew me up and spit me out, but actually it's quite benign. The traction control does a really good job of keeping that power under control. And when you accelerate anywhere between 2,000 and 4,000 RPM, the car's really planted and stable. It's only when you start to approach the red line up towards 7,000, 8,000 RPM that it becomes a bit more of a monster. It feels like a 500 horsepower car to start with, but when you get up into the red zone, that's when you feel what 1,800 horsepower is all about. In fact, the F5 only gives you 1500 horsepower in sport mode. It's only in F5 mode where you get the full 1800 plus. And even then, the car won't give you full power until you're well over 140 miles an hour, simply because it would overwhelm the tires. And on that subject, there is some concern, for me at least, that the Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 rubber used by the F5 aren't rated by Michelin to achieve its theoretical top speed. But Hennessy remains confident the tires are up to the job time will obviously tell. So back to the original question then, is 1800 horsepower too much? Well, with my sensible hat on, yes. <laughs> but also, no. This thing's absolutely mega. I don't know where you'd ever get to use it in anger, but I'm so glad it exists. Hennessy has already achieved a top speed of 270 miles an hour during the car's initial shakedown. And in the future, as it develops the car, it will attempt to push towards its hypothetical 310 mile an hour top speed and perhaps even beyond. Whether it achieves this remains to be seen, but whichever driver is brave enough to attempt this feat, I personally wish you luck.